sure why that is. Hello. How's everyone doing? Can everybody hear me? <sighs> Excellent. Okay. Well, good to see everyone. So I don't know how long we'll go tonight. Fun fact about me, I've had like, I don't know, four hours of meetings today and I cannot stop coughing. I just, I can't stop. I don't know why. And I want to stop because I'm getting on an airplane tomorrow and I'm going to see Steven and Jenna in Brooklyn. So I've got to, I got to pull it together and, and be a little better. So, um, yeah. But anyways, thank you everyone for coming. And I see some people are coming in hot. I mean, I really like that. But Annette, I get that you are coming in slow, like a snail. That's good. So a couple orders of business. Um, the Keystone Clash. I know a lot of you guys are going to it. And I'm going to. I'm going to be a speaker at the Keystone Clash. Maybe you didn't know that. Probably you did know that. But what you might not know is that I am giving two talks at the Keystone Clash. Um, I was originally going to give one, but now I'm giving two. I don't have snappy, snappy titles for you yet, but I'll be giving one talk on um, CO2 for beginners. <coughs> Pardon me. So using CO2 in aquariums for beginners. And the other one will be on zebra or on glowfish. So something kind of different and exciting. And I need help from everyone for the glowfish talk. So if you have glowfish, if you've ever kept them, if you could send me pictures, probably not videos unless, well, if they're really short videos, I can maybe use them. But especially pictures of your glowfish, if you could email them to me, my email, I'll put it in the chat and mods can also post it. So that's my email. If you could email me pictures of your glowfish, I would really appreciate it. Any species of glowfish is fine. I've actually never kept a glowfish, so even though I'm giving a talk about them. But uh, yes, Zenny, glowfish, because I know you've had glowfish. Um, Bunny Viper Ivy has already sent me her beautiful glowfish, and those pictures will be very well used. So um, yeah, send them to me. And other than that, I can't wait to meet everyone at the clash. I'm so excited. I have my uh, <coughs> I have my room booked. Um, I mean, I haven't decided if I'm going to fly or if we're going to drive yet. It's only like eight and a half hours for us. So it's really not that far. But, uh, you know, I don't know what we're going to do yet. But we'll, we'll be there. So I can't wait to see everyone. Um... I think that's it for orders of business. So tonight's topic. So I thought we would talk about um, like where to find scientific papers and what makes a good scientific paper. Um, it's not really, you know, it's not a sexy talk, right? So this is not like cats. You know, that's an exciting topic. Everybody's excited about cats. But it's a really important topic because you can't really evaluate information unless you're considering the primary source. Um, you know, what you hear on the news is written by people who are not scientists. They're not the people who did the work and they get it wrong a lot of times. And that's not always a malicious thing, but it's because they don't have the background to do it. So it's good to, it's good to look up scientific papers. Um, you know, it's also good to look them up if you have a hobby, like maybe fish keeping. Maybe you want to find a paper on that if you're interested in like cichlid breeding or something. Maybe you want to find papers on that. Or, um, you know, maybe you have some health questions. It's good to look up primary information for that. Like maybe you want to know if you should take like um, a statin or not. So instead of like, you know, just generally Googling what you should do, you, you could look it up for yourself on primary literature. You should also ask your doctor about that. I'm just going to put a plug out for that now. That's what doctors are for or your pharmacist. But you can also look up things for yourself. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about how to do that today. So 
Where do you go, first of all? Well, there's a couple of different websites that you can use, and I'm going to show you my favorites. So, <coughs> sorry, I'm just coughing out my lungs. So, a couple of things in the, the comments. I was asked if I'm going to Fishtoberfest. I don't think so. I mean, I really don't. I have no plans on it. Let's put it that way. I think that the only event I'm planning on attending for now is Keystone Clash. I mean, I may go to a local Chicago event because that's not too far from me. Like if there's Aquashella, I don't know. I wasn't super into Aquashella. Um, it's kind of crowded, I think. If I did go, I would just go one day. I don't think I would go more than one day. It's not that far for us. Maybe we would just go for a couple hours and do something else in Chicago. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, but I don't think we'll be going to Fishtoberfest maybe another year. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe I'll speak at Fishtoberfest some other year. Who knows? But uh, no plans right now. But I would like to go out to the Pacific Northwest again. Um, you know, I really like that. I really like visiting there. Well, I lost my light. That's kind of sad. Well, what's that? I don't think I have anywhere else to plug it in. Well, you don't get a light. But, uh, yeah, so scientific papers. So, first of all, the best place to go is um, the website PubMed. So, if you just Google PubMed, it will take you right here. So PubMed is, um, is part of the National Library of Medicine by the National Institute of Health. This is a United States database, but it curates papers that are available worldwide. Um, and it's not just for health papers. It's not just, um, it's for, for any paper, you know, especially in the life sciences is going to be curated by PubMed. And I've probably gone to PubMed, I don't know, Almost every day since like maybe 2000, I've been using it a very long time. It's very powerful, but it's also very easy to use. So there are other databases that you can use, and we'll talk about one of them. But um, the only database more powerful than PubMed is something called Embase. Put that in the chat what that is. And it's super powerful. It's one I use for work. The problem is it has kind of a steep learning curve for how to use it. Um, and it's uh, it's expensive. It's it's a license for it is several thousand dollars. So if you have a like a research institution by you, like a university, you could use Embase because you could use it there for free. But otherwise, it's really not available for people. And it's it's difficult to learn to use. Like it took me a long time to get good at it. But PubMed is really easy to use. It's free. It's available for everyone. And it's pretty simple to use. So I thought we would go through some of the things you can do with PubMed. So first of all, um, I like to do just really basic searches with PubMed. It uses Boolean operators. So let's say um, I want a paper about zebrafish. And I want to learn about their embryogenesis and let's say I want to learn about retinoic acid. So retinoic acid is like a vitamin D derivative. It's important in development. I want to know anything about that. Now I can put limits on that. Let's say I only care and I always do put limits on this. So on the left here, there's some very good limits you can use. So text availability. Um, like when I do searches for work, I'll just click full text. That means that more than the abstract is available. However, in this case, you know, if I'm searching for personal reasons, you're probably going to want to click free full text because you don't want to mess with papers that aren't free. If you work for a university or you're a student in a university, you, you're going to have access to pretty much every journal and you can log in through your institution. And, um, even if you click free full, full text, or you can click just full text then, and um, you know, you'll be able to find whatever you need. But in this case, 
I'm clicking free full text because I just want, um, you know, I just want free papers. So then there's article types, and we'll talk about some of these in a minute. These are not going to help you as much for hobby articles because these mostly pertain to human health with one exception, review. This is a good thing to click if you want to just learn about another topic. So for instance, here's a review, mesoderm patterning by a dynamic gradient of retinoic acid signaling. Okay, that's pretty cool. And what a review is, is it's, um, you know, it's based on evidence, but it's not primary evidence. It's, it's opinion based, but, but it is peer reviewed. And it's a great way to learn about a topic and just kind of get your feet wet on something. So I really like reviews, but they're, they're not primary evidence. Just keep that in mind. So, <coughs> so let's unclick review. Um, and then there are other things you can click. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. Then you can put limits on the publication date. So maybe you want something a little more recent. So five years, one year, whatever. Um, I use custom range a lot where I work because I have to do specific search dates. Um, I click species a lot. You can additional filters. There's all sorts of things that you can pick. Um, you know, I don't click a whole lot of those so often, but you know, they, they could come in handy for you, but species, other animals. So if I wanted something, a non-human paper, I would click other animals for work. I have to you know, everything I want are clinical papers. So I always have that clicked. Languages, um, you can click English if you just want English papers. That can be helpful. The majority of papers are already in English. So sometimes I don't usually bother. Sex, age, other, you know, these, these aren't really very useful filters. Um, and then if you want to reset everything, you can reset all the filters right here. So what it does is it gives you an output of all the things that match those criteria. So here we have cat and lifespan and feline. Well, that's another search I could do. But we wanted zebra, fish, and embryogenesis and retin retinoic acid. And sometimes, like, if I want, like, I'll put, like, quotation marks around that because I want those two words to, to appear together. And, like, part of being able to do good searches is kind of part of why I'm paid so well because, like, you know, I have to do systematic searches. Anyways, let's see what we get for that hit. So 23 papers, that's not too bad. That's, you know, not too many to search through. And you can pull up these papers and it will, these are all freely available. So if I click on any one of these links, so let's see if there are any of these that look interesting to me. So let's say somite morphogenesis is required for axial blood vessel formation during zebrafish embryogenesis. Okay, let's see what that's all about. <coughs> so it lists the title and it lists the abstract right here. You can read the abstract if you want, see if it's something you might be interested in. And then it'll have the free links right here. So cool thing about how science works right now, if science is funded by um, the U.S. government in any way, so that if, they, if you receive either NIH or NSF funding or any other government agency, your text has to be freely available. So you have to submit to a journal that will have it for free, which I think is awesome. Um, that's something that's really changed. I, I love open access publishing. I'm a huge fan of it. Um, so you can either click this link or this link. It doesn't matter which. And this will take you right to the paper where you can read it. And you can click the PDF of it and you can download it. There's the PDF right there. If you want to decide it for some reason, you can pull up the citation. Like if you're writing a paper, you can pull up the citation. So that can make your life easier. And then there's the paper right there. And I can read it. And I can see if I'm interested in it. <coughs> I don't know if I'm interested in this or not, honestly. I don't know anything about this topic. But that's how you find a paper. So 
it's kind of a different question. Like, is this paper any good? Well, I mean, you know, that's kind of hard to say. So, um, you know, what makes a paper good? Well, obviously, like quality of the evidence, um, repeatability of the evidence. So if you see a topic that has a lot of papers on it, if it's really well developed, that kind of means it's, you know, I would say it's a little bit better. But, um, you know, also, is it published in a better quality journal? So there's something called a journal impact factor, which is based on a ratio of um, citations to publications. So there are, there are millions of articles published every year. There's thousands and thousands of journals. And I'm going to tell you right now, the vast majority of them suck. They're really, really bad. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, better articles tend to be cited more. Now, is that, it's not universally true because, you know, science is done by humans and, you know, some scientific topics are just sexier than others. So they're going to get cited more because they're exciting. That's not to say that the science done is poor quality or bad. It, maybe it's just not as exciting. And so it's not going to get in to as high of an impact factor of journal. But there's something called journal impact factor. If you're curious about it, like if you want to know, like, is that really a good journal? And um, so there's rankings of these. And let's see, the top 100 journals in the world with highest impact factor. This is this year. And the number one, I think is nature. Oh, nope. It's the Lancet. It's the Lancet. Yeah. Oh, no, it's nature. So nature has an impact factor of 42.78. That means for every 40 or um, for every article published, it tends to get cited by 42 other papers. That's really good. I mean, that's it used to be Cell had the highest impact factor. This is my favorite journal. Like if I see a paper in Cell, I'm always like, mm, yeah, it's good paper. It's really well done. A lot of supporting evidence. But there are actually papers with higher impact factors now. So like the Lancet, you know. So the higher the number is, the better it is. Um, yeah. But most journals have an impact factor of one or less. That means for everything they publish, one or less um, journals cite it. So Coral Works asks, is it like PolitiFact for journals? Well, I'm not quite sure how PolitiFact works, but this isn't fact checking a journal. It's just saying kind of how popular it is and how much it's cited. And take it with a grain of salt. I take it with a grain of salt because, an art, you know, science can be really well done, but it's really niche and it's just not that cited that well. So let's say you're interested in something like the evolutionary history of rainbow fish. So melanotania, like the fish I keep. Okay, that's just not going to get cited as much as like the study on the COVID vaccine. Okay, that, that got cited a lot because it, it's more interesting to more people. And, you know, science is done by humans and we all have our own biases. So that's impact factor. Now, let's go back to our paper right here. So <coughs> whenever I read a paper, you know, there are different ways you can, can read a paper. So reading the title first is always good because you want to know if you're interested in it. I don't always read the abstract first, especially if it's not for a type, if it's not for a subject matter I know well, just because the abstract is so dense with information that, uh, you know, I might not understand it that well yet. So I think it's good to read the introduction because if you're not acquainted well with the field, it can kind of give you some background on it. Um, you know, if you're really well versed in a field, you probably won't bother reading it. And then you want to read, I don't necessarily read the method section unless there's something I specifically need to know. For work, I often have to pick things out of that. Um, but honestly, you can probably skip the method section. But then you want to really read the results section. This is the most important section 
you know, looking through all the figures. This is where you can evaluate the data yourself. And if you aren't knowledgeable enough of, of about a field, and that's okay to, to understand all those figures, you can go on and read the discussion section. But I often don't read the discussion section of papers because I'm not really interested in their opinion on their science. I kind of just want to see their facts and I want to evaluate them for myself. And I almost never read discussions. So it's up to you how you read it. But, um, you know, that's that's how all scientific papers are organized. One, a couple of interesting things you might want to look at. Toward the end of certainly all papers mod in the past, like, 10, 20 years. If we go all the way to the end of this. Da, da, da. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Don't get dizzy. Let's see. So there's the discussion. At the very end of this, so they've got their methods at the end. Sometimes methods are at the end. Acknowledgements, don't care much about that. Um, but there's always some statements on biases. And I find this very interesting, um, especially in my line of work. I work for pharma. And I want to know if someone is sponsoring that data because we're human beings, we have biases, and I want to know if there's bias to the data. Now, that's not to say that a company-sponsored study is bad. Companies are required to sponsor studies in order to get their drugs and devices approved by regulatory bodies. Um, and it's very good when those studies are peer-reviewed because that means that someone is checking the work. But I want to know if there's any bias there. So in this case, additional interest, there's no competing interests declared in any of the authors. Sometimes there will be some statements on author contribution because they'll say this person did this and this person did this. And that sort of thing is really good to know. Um, and it also tell like if there's a funding agency, um, here they have a statement on ethics because it's done in fish and vertebrates. You have to have clearance in the United States from an IRB. So all of the animals were handled according to approved institutional animal care and use committee protocols of that university. So that's Stony Brook. So, you know, things like that are good to know. Biases really only come into play with, um, well, in my case, with like human health papers, because I want to know if a company is setting that study, you know, if they're sponsoring that study, it's then you can always just take it with a little grain of salt. That doesn't mean it's a bad study. That doesn't mean the data is bad, but I like to know it. So that's PubMed. <coughs> and I think PubMed is the best way to find a paper, but it's not the only freely available way. And the other way that maybe you have used before is um, is uh, Google Scholar. So I actually don't really like Google Scholar because it doesn't have very good filters and it can give you so much crap back. So in PubMed, the key terms that you enter, they will be mentioned in either the title or the abstract. Whereas Google Scholar, it will pull anything from the article and you will get so much crap. So if we look at here, the search that we did on zebrafish and embryogenesis and retinoic acid, if we put that into Google Scholar. <clears throat> so we're getting eight back. So I want to give it a filter. So let's say since 2019, notice I have 8,190 articles. And I guarantee, and I think we got 23 with our PubMed search, almost all of this is total garbage. There are a couple of things you can do to clean this up if you want to use Google Scholar. I actually recommend just using PubMed instead. But if you're hell-bent on it, and I do have to use Google Scholar for your work. But if you, instead of sorting by dates or by relevance, your life gets so much better. Here we cut it down to eight results. You can also, um, I'm not including patents or citations 
Because I don't care about patents or citations ever. If you care about patents and citations, click those. You're going to get a whole lot more junk coming through. So, um, and again, it's always a real hit and miss what kind of articles you get. So some of these are probably pretty good. I'm looking at them. They're not bad. And you, you get different articles than you would with PubMed. <coughs> huh. You know, it's... It, it does work a little differently, Google Scholar does. It's not one that I prefer to use, but I have to search more than one database for what I do. And so I usually do have to do um, a Google Scholar search. So what if you're interested in something for human health? So let's say you're going in for a kind of surgery, like you're getting a hysterectomy, and you want to read what the most current articles are on that. So there's a couple of places you can go. So there is, um, <coughs> so I guess we'll take, we'll take a detour on that. So like what makes a good clinical article? So clinical articles are a little bit different than, um, a basic science article. So basic science articles, they have, usually a lot bigger study populations. Like back when I used to work on yeast, I had a thousand cells. I counted at every single time point and I did a hundred time points and I repeated the experiment twice. So, you know, I had a lot of data, but you know, with human studies, you're not going to get near that many. That's just not what you're going to get. Um, so, but there's different levels of evidence and quality of papers depending on what kind of study there are. So the lowest level of evidence for human clinical studies are either they're just expert opinions. So that's like maybe some surgeon is writing like, hey, I really like this technique. It works well for my patients. But it's not presenting any clinical evidence based on a trial. It's just their opinion. And that's not to say that doesn't have value, but it's considered the lowest level of evidence on what this is called the Oxford levels of evidence. So then on up the ziggurat, you have case series. So this would be like a case study. So that's where some doctor would write something like, hey, I saw something cool. You know, I had a baby who was born with 14 toes and they were all pink and sparkly, you know. So Cora Works says, I saw this new article that was like blueberries proven to reverse Alzheimer's. And it turned out the study they were citing had a sample size of 40, 22 showed improvements. And it was funded by some blueberry coalition. And the blueberries weren't fresh or frozen, but freeze-dried powder. And it was like 40 grams a day or something crazy. Yeah. And that's because journalists seldom have scientific backgrounds. A lot of articles right now are written by AI and that's going to get worse and they're really bad. And so you, you kind of, you have to look up things on your own. Yeah. It's, you know, but that's not to say that blueberries might not do something. You would need to look for a high quality, higher quality study, or maybe they'd have to do a higher quality study. So this is a case study. And then <coughs> The, the best qualities of studies are randomized control trials and either systematic reviews or meta-analyses are even better than that. So a randomized control trial is where the researchers have a control and an experimental population and the study administrator doesn't know who is going to get which treatment. It's blinded somehow. So if it's a drug study, you're going to give a drug to and a placebo. And you don't know who will get which until you unblind everything at the end of the study. And that's considered a very high quality study. So that's a randomized control trial. But even higher than that is something called a meta-analysis or a systematic review. And you've maybe heard of meta-analyses before. Um, so like they'll say like a meta-analysis done out of Harvard University says that eating kale every day will lengthen your lifespan by 2%. Okay. If you hear the word meta-analysis, it's, it's, it's much higher quality evidence. I mean, you could still look, you probably still should look it up for yourself and decide but that's kind of a magic word for better. So you can actually find meta-analyses and systematic reviews through 
PubMed. <coughs> so let's do something human -y for our filters. Let's do like kale and cancer. All right, and let's see if there's any meta-analyses and systematic reviews on it. So I'll tell you the difference between the two of those in a minute, but oh, go back. Okay, so I'm going to click meta-analysis. I'm going to click systematic review. Uh, wow, it's pulling shit up. That's amazing. I'm going to give it 10 years. And what do we get? Well, we had six articles. Cruciferous vegetable consumption and gastric cancer risk, a meta-analysis of epidemiological studies. Okay. Wow. I'm amazed. So there's a few studies there and they're meta-analyses. So what a meta-analysis is, is somebody did a, um, <coughs> a systematic literature review. And this is actually what I do for a living. So someone came up with a search string, kind of like like this, and they put it into a database like PubMed. They also use Embase because it's much more powerful. And they have inclusion and exclusion criteria to systematically appraise all of that literature. So things like inclusion criteria would be like relevant to kale and cancer published in the past 10 years. Exclusion would be like case studies um, excluding like, um, expert opinions there, are, you know, but it's done by a systematic process and that reduces bias from the process. And so that's why meta-analyses and systematic reviews are so powerful. Now, the difference between the two of those things is with a meta-analysis, they can actually do statistical analysis on the data that they get. So that means they are able to compare apples to apples. Now you can't always do that because if the, the articles you get, you have apples and oranges, you can't compare them. So you can still do a systematic review, which is not quite as good as a meta-analysis, but you can, um, <coughs> oh, would kale cure this cough? I don't know, maybe. Um, you know, you, you can still present the data. You just can't make a statistical argument on the whole population of it, but they're both valuable. So that's a meta-analysis and a systematic review. I do these for a living actually, because for drugs and devices that I'm applying to like the FDA or um, Europe's governing bodies for approval, you have to survey all of the literature that's there that on the drugs or the devices, whether it's been sponsored by the company or just, you know, somebody else did a study on it and you have to present all the data that's there, whether it's good or bad. So the governing body can evaluate it. So that's what I do for a living. It's very glamorous. I'm, I lead an exciting life. So another place you can look for these meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and they're really good, is actually the Cochrane Library. Cochrane Library. Cochrane Library. So Cochrane Reviews are sponsored by, I think, Johns Hopkins, the Cochrane Library is. These are all freely available, and these are all systematic reviews and meta-analyses that are very high quality, and they are huge. Um, and you can search for them. And the cool thing about them is they always give a lay person's, um, review of the data. So, you know, because I'm not a surgeon, I don't understand surgery techniques, but I can see it written in lay people's language, which is helpful. So if you look up kale and cancer, let's see if there's any Cochrane articles on that. And so you, there's no Cochrane reviews on it. I just kind of ignore all of these other things. These are clinical trials that are on an underway for it. But, um, you know, oh, it looks like there was one in 2020. What's that? Well, if it's Cochrane reviews, there aren't any. So alas, there aren't any yet. But there are many, many Cochrane reviews. They're very long. They tend to be over 100 pages. But they have that summary at the beginning that you can read that's really helpful. I like Cochrane Library a lot. 
um, yeah, I think that's all for this topic. Yeah. I mean, my cough does sound pretty horrible. Coral works. Um, I have asthma and I just, you know, once I get a cock, it cough, <laughs> once I get a cough, it's really hard to shake. And, uh, yeah, but I'll be in Louisiana a couple days and it'll be like 30 degrees warmer than it is here. And there'll be sunshine and, you know, I'll have Jenna taking care of me and feeding me king cake and it's gotta help. Like it's gotta get better. So yeah. But does anybody have any questions about anything? It doesn't have to be about this. Let's see what you've said. Jeff says, I love steak. Steak is way tastier than kale. I am not a huge carnivore to tell you the truth, but, um, you know, I don't mind steak. I just don't eat it very often, but I think kale is disgusting. I like other vegetables though a lot. I eat mostly vegetables and fruits. Coro says, I had respiratory affections as a kid and it's the same deal. When I get allergies or a cough, I sound way sicker than I am from the damage. Yeah. I mean, these coughs, they just like, they settle in and they just set up shop there and they just don't lead. Well, June says, do you mean Zephram Cochran? No, but I appreciate your Star Trek reference. Way to go, June. <coughs> so I'm going to scroll up and make my way down. Because I missed a lot of comments, I'm sure. Um, da -dum, da -dum. So Lady Rorschach asks, I know you'll do great, Kelly. Any chance they will post the presentations online? I don't think so. Um, I suppose I could choose to present it online. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. I haven't decided. I mean... I kind of feel like any time I would give a talk on something, I would, for a fish club or something, I would give a different talk. I know that a lot of speakers like to recycle their talks, but I kind of don't, I mean, I can come up with, I can talk all day long. I used to be a professor, so I would come up with something new. So I don't know what, I don't know what will happen yet. Uh, glowfish, glowfish, glowfish. <coughs> New local Austin says, I am sending a pic of my goldfish because I like him. While I do want to see your goldfish, I need glowfish for the talk. But I do want to see your goldfish. I mean, if you want to just spam me more for cat pictures, you can, you know. So Tommy asks, are limpets a good food source for community fish and smaller cichlids or better for puffers? I don't know. I mean, they would have to be fish that can chomp on a shell unless you crush them up first. I don't really know a lot about cichlids. I don't raise them. I'm sure your puffers would chomp them. But I am not an expert in those things. So the chat would have to help you with that. And Fish Dream says, I killed my granddaughter's glowfish. Oops. I mean, I don't know how hardy these fish are. I mean, they come from pet stores. I don't know how well they're taken care of. You know, what I'm saying is it's probably not your fault. Lady Rorschach says, I adore scientific papers. Such a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of wealth of knowledge. There's a lot of really shitty papers, too. And one thing that working in pharma has taught me is, oh, my God, the papers are so bad. I mean, I came from a world of basic science. And I was just used to a lot higher quality papers than, than are in the health field. I mean, cohorts are so tiny. The statistics are really poor, in my opinion. Sometimes they don't even have statistics. So, I mean, it's just been really challenging because, you know, unfortunately, science is done by humans, right? And some humans need to get tenure. And to get tenure, you have to publish. And what happens is the least publishable unit is what gets published. So instead of publishing a really complete study, you know, it's a really good story and has lots of repetition of the data. Just it's published in like little chunks. And sometimes it's not really very good. And so that's why wading through some of it is important. That's why looking for meta-analyses is really good because they've done a lot of the appraising for you. 
Um, and that's why, you know, looking for better quality journals is nice. So if I see something in nature, I'm like, yeah, that's probably pretty good there. I mean, I can tell you firsthand that those reviewers are tough. And so only good shit gets published. <laughs> Lady Rorschach says, totally get it, Kelly. I am not too keen on Aquashella either. I would like to attend it once for the experience, but the clash is where it's at. I mean, all the cool kids will be at the clash. I mean, I've never been to the clash, so I cannot say, but I mean, lots of cool people are going to be there. Um, as for Aquashella, I mean, I kind of had a different experience of it because I was in the aquascaping competition, which was just very focused hours of work. So I just stood in front of a tank and I didn't get to talk to people. I didn't get to hang out with people that much. I mean, I think I gave like Tim Crypt Keeper a hug maybe once. I hugged Scuba Steve, but like I didn't get to hang out with him at all, which is really sad. I would have liked to have hung out with them but I was so busy with that aquascape. Um, so it was really a different way to experience it. I think though, that if you're a person who wants to meet people and hang out, you can still have fun at Aquashella because there are cool people at it. And I did get to meet some of them. I just didn't have the time with them, but you know, you can always make your own fun at things. And if you go to something with the mindset that you're going to have fun and you're going to meet people and you're going to be with your friends, you can do it because you can always leave for a cup of coffee or a lunch, you know, so. And I would love to hang out with you guys in Portland, too. I've never been to Portland. I've been to Oregon. I have family there, but I've never been to Portland. So um, da -dum, da -dum. scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. <coughs> June says, I was watching in 240p, cranked it to go hot. Now Kelly's crystal clear. Well, I am using a super fancy camera, but unfortunately my light died. So I don't have like a glow that makes me look 15 years younger from the ring light. Very sad. You're stuck with my middle-aged face. <coughs> Coral Work says, how frequently other people build on this journal's research? Yeah, so that's what that's what the impact factor is. It's just a citation in text. Just kind of says how popular something is. You know, but popular isn't always the isn't the only measure of quality. Yep, Lady Rorschach says, I skip the discussion too, Kelly, unless I'm looking for some edification on a missing aspect of the paper. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I want to know what their opinions are on the work, but I mean, especially if it's a topic I know really well. I don't want to know their bullshit opinions on it. So I skip it. And for work, like I am there just to pick out data to do meta analyses. I don't care. I don't care about their discussion about it at all. It's not relevant to me. So Craig says <coughs> an albino Corey that was, his head was stuck. Well, first stuck in a power head just spiked me. Ouch. Was it one of those Corys that, that has a toxin? That's no good. So Mark Strelson says tobacco and oil companies come to mind. You know, they don't sponsor a whole lot of clinical studies. It's mostly the bias you need to look for are from, is from pharma. So either devices, drugs, or in vitro diagnostics. Um, you know, I don't, there's some sponsored by tobacco. I'm, you know, Coca-Cola has sponsored studies, but there's just not, not as much of that. You need to look out for pharma. I mean, we're everywhere. We employ a lot of people. <clears throat> Mark says, Jeff, most of the papers on smoking sponsored by big tobacco were junk. Well, yeah, I mean, gosh, the bias in that. Kids don't smoke. I mean, I'm not a medical doctor, but I, I think I can confidently tell you, don't smoke. I mean, I sound like I smoke because I have shitty lungs, but I do not. All right. Geek Boy says 2%, but you have to eat kale every day. So 2% more misery. You know, sometimes it's not just not worth it, right? Take me now, Lord. I don't want to eat kale. Don't fall for big kale's propaganda. Amen to that. I don't want to eat kale. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Uh, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. 
It's all in how you prepare it. So I have had kale salads that are a little bit better. I know that if you take the kale and you pour olive oil on it and you massage it to kind of break up some of the fibers, like it's fine. It's okay. But I'm never going to, I'm never going to be excited about kale. I mean, there are a thousand other foods I would rather eat. <coughs> Mark says, you take care of yourself, Kelly. A bad cough and, and asthma are a bad mix. I know. I have shitty lungs. It's just, I, um, you know, I have a lot of treatment strategies for it, though. Um, you know, I've had asthma a long time. I'm drugged. It helps. <sighs> Foxanne is reminding me, Kayla's delicious, nutritious, and full of vitamin K. Very important for some people. Kale is an often thing for me. That's because you're a better person than I am, Roxanne. I am a bad person who doesn't want to eat kale. But you are a good person. We And that's right. Jenny says, we'll give you all the kale. That's right. <clears throat> June, I don't know if they make glow Oscars yet. Do they? I haven't looked that up. But if you get a glow, glow Oscar, I want to see it. That would be really cool. <sighs> All right. Core work says, wouldn't limpets be harder to pull off the glass or chomp on than bladder snails or ram's horns? They seem flatter to me. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a snail is a lot easier to pry off the glass. I don't really see a whole lot of freshwater limpets. Like, I've never had them in a tank. I've never really had an infestation on them. And I feel like if you wanted to feed a puffer... Like, it's so much easier to culture ram's horns and pond snails. I would think that that would be your first choice for food. But I am not an expert on puffer keeping or, or snail culture or limpet culture. And I guess I am an expert on how to grow pond snails. I have those. So, <coughs> Zenny says, I don't know. I feel like kale's got to have one of those camp cam ugh, chemicals that makes it taste good to some. And like dumpster drainage to others. Maybe Kelly can tell us. Well, I can. So brassicas, so that would be kales, broccoli, cauliflower, collard greens, mustard greens. Those are brassicas. They have a comp they have compounds in them called glucosinolates. And um, to some people, those taste more bitter than others. That's why I hate Brussels sprouts. They like, why would you eat little stink cabbages? But I've been told some people just think they're sweet and delicious. So some people are more sensitive to glucosinolates than others. Like I don't mind the glucosinolates that are in broccoli, I think is pretty good. Cabbage, I think is good. But like kale is, ugh, and Brussels sprouts, gross. They're just like little, little balls of stink. All right. Tommy says, anyone question, Daphne, can it be off-white, almost yellow color exoskeleton, or are they always transparent? I'm trying to identify critters in muck and having a lot of difficulty. <coughs> I mean, I, the only Daphne I've seen kind of are transparent, but I'm not an expert on um, tiny crustaceans either. Um, there's also like isopods. There's different kinds of amphipods. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I can't help you, but Google Lens might be a good help for you. I know Zenny is a big Google Lens fan, so you might want to go for that. Tim says, collards is about as bitter as I like to go with greens. Kale is just a little bit too bitter to me. I feel that way, too. I like collard greens. I think those are pretty good. I like cabbage, though. That's really sweet. Like, of the brassicas, I think kale is pretty good. But Mark says, I feel a kale and Swiss chard spanakopita coming on. You live your best life, Mark. If that's what makes you happy, you do it. I will not stand in your way. And you are half a world away from me. So I don't feel threatened by your cookery one bit. <clears throat> Tommy says they move skittish like Daphne. I don't know. I'm not an expert at those little crustacea. So I hope that you um, will post some pictures for us so we can all learn more. All right, New Local Austin says, I find a lot of evidence-based nursing studies that have sample sizes of less than 30. Can you talk about sample sizes for studies and usefulness for implementing in practice? Yes, I can. Um, and this is one of, when I do my systematic reviews, one of the most common um, exclusion criteria I apply are studies with less than 25 individuals in a cohort. 
And that's because it's less quality. Um, I do see it a lot though. Um, especially like if it's a more rare surgery. So like I did, I worked on a, a device, um, and they were little, um, interpos interposition implants for the hand. So if you had really severe hand arthritis, you could get a little piece of pyrocarbon interpolated into the joint to give you, restore some mobility. But those were really rare surgeries. Um, they only sold maybe like three or four units of three or 400 units of those per year. And so there just wasn't much data out there. And so you kind of just took what you could get. So it kind of depends, but like for a drug study, I don't want anything with less than like a hundred individuals in each cohort. And I want, I want an, I want a, I want an RCT. You know, and that's not to say that there isn't some value in smaller cohort studies. It's just lower quality evidence. Um, and meta-analyses, typically what they'll do is they'll tell you what kind of papers are getting included in either the meta-analysis or systematic review. Like they'll say like they excluded articles that were case studies or they excluded anything with less than 30 individuals, or they excluded lower quality evidence because, um, you know, they just wanted to inject that stringency. But yeah, it is really frustrating to see those really small studies. And I see it all the time in medical papers and it's super frustrating. And, um, you know, basic science is just a lot higher quality. Unfortunately, human health studies are just bad. All right. Crypt Keeper says, got my blue or your aura blue tigers in today. Those sound like very exciting shrimp DD. Too exciting for me. I think I would kill them. But I have I have confidence you will breed many of them. This is exciting. So Lady Rorschach says, scientific studies have proven that dark greens have higher concentration of bitterness compounds compared to other veggies and everyone has varying levels of tolerance. Yeah, I mean, some people can, they can just eat the most bitter of foods. And like, I hate beer. I think beer is gross. So I'm just a little more sensitive to that. But, you know, I still manage to eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of them. I do my best. Lady Rorschach says, I adore Swiss chard. So Swiss chard is not a brassica. That is actually in the beet family. So if you watch What Your Plants, I mentioned um, uh, plants in the family Betalaceae. So they have a compound in them called betalane, which is what makes them pink. They're in the beet family. So beet, rhubarb, Swiss chard, the pink in that all comes from the compound betalane and not from anthocyanin. And that's the defining characteristic of that family. Kind of cool. So Tommy says, Coro, yes, you're right. They are most eaten by wrasse. I went down the rabbit hole on it while listening. Nothing else can really open their shell. <coughs> so incoming cool fact a limpet's tooth is stronger than a bulletproof vest wow that's a fact i did not expect coming yeah i mean that's pretty cool limpets are really cool organisms i don't know anything about the freshwater ones but the marine ones are very cool and they have to be able to adhere really tightly to the rocks because a lot of them live in intertidal zones so um you know they could get pull off the rocks really easily. So kind of cool. So Tim says, Kelly, meeting you in Brooklyn for the first time was definitely a highlight of the trip, even though only very briefly. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I'm sorry we didn't really get to hang out more because I would have loved to have hung out with you more, but I will make sure we hang out at the clash. We will, we will have lunch or something and you can suggest to me all the terrible topics you want. And I... I will do it. I will do it. So Lady Rorschach says, I wish I could, Lori. It's just way too expensive this year. Trying for next year, though. That's a heck of a flight for you. I mean, flight prices are so expensive right now. You know, even for me to go to Louisiana, I'm like, oh, my God, this trip is kind of expensive. These peas better be worth it. They better be worth it. <coughs> they are buying me king cake, though. So... Let's see. Is it almost? Oh, no, no. 
So Zanny says, Lady R, I must just ha not have a tolerance for it with my delicate toddler-like palate. You're just a woman of refined taste, Zanny. That's all there is to that. So Coral Works says, ooh, that's pretty nifty. I think some other animals have teeth that are stronger than the ceramic due to the layers. Cool fact, Silver. Maybe we should talk about gastropods sometime. I mean, maybe we should have a salute to snails because I know that people have asked me about snail genetics and some other things, and I'm, I'm not a super expert on them, but, you know, maybe we'll talk about it. You know, you guys can always suggest topics to me. You can suggest them in the chat. You can hit me up on the Discord. Maybe some of our mods will post the link to the Discord. Um, you know, you can email them to me. You can you can send me them on Facebook. You can send me smoke signals. You can send me a nice card with topics. But I'm open to suggestions. So, <coughs> Dee Dee says... <clears throat> Tim, I did some video before I had to get in the backyard to hose the fire down that had traveled from two houses away. Too close for comfort. Dee Dee, this sounds dramatic. Oh my gosh. So do you have video of this, this fire happening? I need to know more. I'm glad you're okay. I'm hoping your fish were all okay. okay. I mean, those smoke fumes can't be good. Lady Rorschach says... It's all right, Zenny. It just means that you have a very delicate palate that doesn't tolerate bitterness. It's a relic of our ancestors' detections for to toxins in plants. That's true. Zenny and I are not going to get poisoned to death by a plant. We will spit it out. We're, we're not going down because of a plant. Other things may kill us, but not a plant. <coughs> Silver Creek says, for sure, I swear, underwater critters merit more study than they have been given. Amen to that. I think underwater critters are so clue or so cool. I um I really love I I love invertebrates. I think they're so cool. I love marine invertebrates. I love well, and I love marine vertebrates. I'm a fan of oceans. Like most girls, I went through a phase where I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I've been told that being a marine biologist is a lot of like dissecting whale carcasses. And man, that just ain't where it's at. I don't want to do that. I suffered enough for my PhD. I don't want to do that. Someone else told me that for their PhD, they had to just sort through whale poop. Can you imagine sorting through tons of whale poop? I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. I suffered enough. I inhaled so many formaldehyde fumes. Someday we can talk about that. Like the amount of IQ points I shaved off from my time working as a graduate student. But yeah, I did not have to sort through whale poop. Yeah. All right. Denny says, I'm just trying to protect the village from being poisoned. Dang it. That's right. You wouldn't, you would never, you would never do that to someone. <laughs> All right, Dee Dee says, Tim, no one did, but the man burning leaves lost a shed and the neighbors beside me, half the grass in their yard, it took the fire department a long time to get here. Oh my gosh. Wow. All right. Tommy asks, anyone else eat Manuka honey? I put some in my shake at least three times a week with Moringa. So Moringa is a superfood. I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's very trendy. The thing with Manuka honey, so it has a lot of things attributed to it, but it is also very frequently fraudulent because there is not much genuine Manuka honey on the market. And I'm not aware of any regulatory body that regulates if the Manuka honey is genuine or not. So I don't know. I would be really careful what I spend my money on. It's kind of like how there's a lot of fake olive oil out there, which is too bad because I love expensive olive oil. All right. Nathan Hovey says tourmaline balls. Worth it or no? I got some as it said it would help add minerals to the water that would help snails and shrimps and fish. Did I get taken for a ride? Well, let's look at what minerals tourmaline are made. All right, hang on, I'm Googling it for you. All right, so tourmaline is a crystalline silicate mineral group in which boron is compounded with elements such as aluminum, iron, magnesium, sodium, lithium, or potassium. So I, th I think you got to take him for a ride. So <laughs> what snails and shrimps need in their shells 
are um, calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. That's what shells are made of, mostly calcium carbonate. Um, so you want to give them calcium carbonate. So crayfish, crayfish Empire makes things like snail cookies that you can give your snails. Those are good. Um, I think shrimp envy is probably a good food for shrimp health. I'm not an expert on shrimp and fish or shrimp foods. I'm not really a shrimp keeper or a snail keeper, but I do know that that's what shells are made of. Um, snail shells are not made of silicates, which is what tourmaline is made of. Now, maybe it's called tourmaline balls, but it's not made of tourmaline. I don't know. I've never heard of those before, but I would like to know more if anyone in the chat has heard anything. All right. Geek Boy says, oh, the truth comes out. I drink kale smoothies, but it is a couple of leaves of kale and a ton of fruit and berries. You got to do what you got to do. I mean, you know, if you've got to hide your kale. So Jake and I went through this phase where we're like, we were trying to eat like six cups of vegetables a day. And we we're like, well, the only way we can do it is if we drink it. And so we started making these smoothies with with all kinds of things. The problem is, is that I don't have a very good blender. And so the kale wouldn't get pulverized enough. <sighs> that was deep hurting. That was not a phase that lasted in our relationship. We also went through something where Jake thought we should be eating maca root powder. Oh my God. It's so disgusting. It's just the grossest. Oh God. Jake loves fad diet. He just really, really does. Okay. By the way, we don't, I need to quit sharing. Stop sharing. There we go. <coughs> All right. I love this. Ugh, stop. Cancel. There we go. Dee Dee says, Scotty, I was hot stuff today. Dee Dee, you're hot stuff every day. You're never not hot stuff. All right. Kale is in the dirty dozen. So my sister is big on this supposed dirty dozen something like things that have the most pesticide use. I don't know how true that is. I know that that is science funded by maybe biased agencies. So I don't, I don't know. I also don't know if it maybe washes off better than other things. I would say that you should wash all of your fruits and vegetables um, before you eat them, it's whether they're organic or not. I mean, if they're organic, you, you should still wash them because you could still get salmonella. You're more likely to get salmonella from sprouts or green onions than you are from chicken. They call them sprout breaks. All right. Dee Dee, why they set in fire this time of year? Lower temperatures means less humidity. Things burn easier in the cold. I don't know, Dee Dee. I don't, I don't know. Inquiring minds want to know. Coral Works says they make glow sharks. I bet glow tiger Oscars is next. I have gone on the website of the company that makes glow fish and there are a lot of fish. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is why there are more glow fish on the market now and how technology has changed to make, uh, making glow critters easier to make. So we will talk about that some. All right, Matt says, someone say bad person. <laughs> I'm here just working on stuff. Matt, you're a good person. You have good pets. You have great pets. You should pet your pets for me. All right. Core work says, or scuds. Scuds or pond sales are probably the easiest. I've heard scuds are easy to culture. And one thing I would like to do someday, so I really want to have a sump on my next big take. I think it would be really cool to make the bottom have like a big sump refugium that could feed the critters in the upper tank. I think that'd be really cool. And then I could grow more plants, but it wouldn't keep any fish in there. I would just like grow scuds, lots of scuds, just like live food with no work. Cause I am lazy. Mark says, grow your own kale, Miss Dady. It is easy and it tastes much better. Yeah. Kale is really easy to grow up in the North too, because 
interesting thing about brassica is they do taste sweeter in colder temperatures if they get a little frost. DD doesn't really have colder temperatures, but there are varieties for hotter climates. <coughs> Johnny says, I don't mind greens, but kale is bad. I know. It's not great. It's not great. Coral Works says, is that like the soap gene with cilantro? No. So um, cilantro tastes gross because of, I think, an alkaloid. It's not a glucosinolate. So it's different. But I bet there's a lot of overlap between those people. I mean, I don't like cilantro either. I'm picky. We talk about my pickiness a lot on the stream. It just happens. Little Stink Cabbages is an apt name. It's also a good name for a band, I think. You know. <coughs> yeah. I agree with you, Jeremy. Fuck Kale. That's right. I said it. This is um this is a PG thirteen stream. We can swear on it. Advise your children before listening to Science is Fundamental. All right. I have shrimp pellets made with kale. At one thousand subs, I will eat one. You heard that first. Uh, mods, please put the link to Crypt Keeper Aquatics down there. For one, you need to voice your displeasure to him about his suggestions for topics on white your plants. And two, I want him to I want to see him eat a shrimp pellet. But it's probably not the worst thing in the world. I think the worst thing in the world would be those canned blood worms. I am absolutely disgusted by even the thought of it. Like I saw some when I last went to uh, the fish store in Indianapolis and oh god, that's so gross. So gross. Silver Creek says, kale can grow over winter as well. If worried, you can cover the plant, but I've seen it growing with snow atop it. It can. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit much this far north because, you know, we have kind of harsher winters than that. So it may, it's probably not going to last quite as much because, especially if you're in Iowa, you know, the winters are pretty, pretty brutal. Usually, though, this winter has been weird. <laughs> Didi reminds us that Stephen ate Snello. That's right. I mean, you got to do what you got to do to grow your channel. I only have 145 subs. Maybe if I said I would eat some gross food, I would have more subs. But you know what? I just don't care. All right. Coral Work says sea shrimps and ostracods can be a little more opaque than Daphnia. Yeah, there's so many little crustaceans in both freshwater and saltwater environments. And we just don't get to see them that much. Once in a while, I'll see something in my tank kind of crawling around, but you got to think the rainbow fish are going to pick most of that off. So I don't see a lot of it. All right. <coughs> mustard greens are the tops. I don't know the tops of what, but I, I don't mind mustard greens. They're not so bad. Jenna ate the snello too. She did. She's very brave. She did. She ate the snello too. All right. Cannot stand cilantro. I think cilantro is gross. I mean, that's not to say I won't eat it occasionally. Like, I don't know if you order pho or like salsa. I mean, it has a little bit of in it. I'm always like, why is this here? It's just making things soapy. But like, I can tolerate it. It's just not something I really like. All right, Johnny says arugula and horseradish greens are his name favorite. Those are not brassicas. I believe arugula is in uh, the daisy family. Horseradish, that is in the carrot family, APAC. So arugula would be in Asteraceae, which is the daisy family. I think I would have to look that up, but I'm fairly certain it is. They, neither one of those are brassicas. All right, Tim, if the collards are bitter, add a little sugar in the pot. Dee Dee is giving you a really good culinary life lesson. Sugar makes things better. <coughs> I miss this. So apparently we ate bees knees shrimp food on Skipper's stream. You wasted that on Skipper. You should have done that on your own stream. Don't give Skipper all the good content. You save that for yourself. Steven says, Google likes you too, Zenger, and it truly loves you for you because it knows more about you than anyone else in your life ever will. I mean, that's one way to look at it. 
I mean, you know, I'd like to think Amazon loves me. It knows what I like. Facebook doesn't know fuck all about me. They always suggest the worst things for me. Jeremy says, I ate real food one time. Y'all should try it with your fish food eating selves. I mean, if it's the only food you have, I guess. Dee Dee says, I inadvertently have eaten cat shrimp food many times, biting pieces when they are too big. Not bad at all. Good to know. I mean, you know, I guess if it's good enough for the... If it's good enough for you, it's good enough for the shrimps. I'm not good at guarding my privacy anyway, so at least Google knows what I need when I don't. And soon we'll all have chat GPT. So I've been reading articles about like how that's going to revolutionize medical writing. But, you know, I was kind of thinking like chat GPT can never do what I do. And that's like making a silk purse out of the sow's ear of all of the shitty regulatory inputs that companies have. A computer can't do that. Only a human can do that. All right, Alex says, Ram's horns are the way to go with Congo spotted puffers and pea puffers. Okay, there you go. I've never had any puffer fish, but I do know that Ram's horns are pretty easy to grow tons of. I've got like 1 million of them, probably. I don't really do any work to grow them. Um, and some of them get pretty big. I mean, I've had some that are like three quarters of an inch. Fish Dream says, I busted a large jar of sauerkraut. Oh, gosh. And a batch of rishpashi on the floor today. You're not having a good day. <laughs> you know, we might talk about sauerkraut one of these days. Because I might do a stream on fabulous fermented foods. I used to do a, when I was a professor, I would give a lecture on fa fabulous fermented foods when I taught microbiology. And then we would have a buffet where we would eat different fermented foods. And that was pretty fun. You got to do what you've got to do to get good evaluations when you're a professor. And food is the surest way to buy those. Oh, Nancy did not get the notification. I'm sorry, but there's the replay. <coughs> so then he says, I can drink basic light beer, but I have no interest with having my taste buds assaulted by hops. Yeah. Why? I think that nobody really likes IPAs. I think they just drink them because they think they're supposed to be cool and drink IPAs, but nobody really likes them. They're gross. Like, even if you're a person who likes beer, there's better tasting beers than IPAs. And I don't care if this causes you to unsubscribe from me. I just don't care. Just do it. All right. I'm a Rico behind shaking my head. I'm at work while I lurk, but I wish Kelly would hung out with me. It's true, Scuba Steve. I wish we would hang out. We could have we hung out more. We would have had a good time. But I was building that damn aquascape. And then I had to tear it down. And that's why I don't really want to do it again. Because, like, you know, I put so much work into it. And the team put so much work into it. And like, I really wanted to just watch it grow. But, no, you just go and tear it down at the end of it. And I don't really want to do that again. All right. <coughs> they were locked into that scape. And I didn't want to interrupt. <sighs> that was a lot of hours on my feet. That was hard work. Everybody on that team worked really hard. We did not win. I don't get me wrong, Zenger. I too embrace Daddy Google. It makes it easier for me not to have to remember my own wants and needs. I mean, they're just there to make your life better. Like, Instagram really gets me. Instagram knows the shit I want to buy, especially for luxury goods. I'm always like, you know, those sheets would look great. All right, I like hops while the alpha acids are still active. Once they get converted to beta acids by either heat or oxidation, it becomes overly bitter instead of aromatic. I don't really know anything about hops in beer because I do not like beer, but I will take your word for it. I just think they all taste gross. I've never really had a beer that I've liked. I, everyone's like, oh, you'll like this. you like this. I'm like, I just don't care. I don't really drink. All right. 
I have a crap ton of rhubarb in my garden. The leaves are top toxic. So does that toxic break down in compost? Yes. So that toxic is it's not it's not toxic per se. So rhubarb is leaves are bad for you because they have a lot of oxalic acid in them. So what all oxalic acid does is it precipitates out and it forms crystals on your kidneys. And that's what's bad for you. Um, but that does break down in your garden because there are bacteria that can metabolize oxalic acid. And so it's just fine. So go ahead and compost it. Rhubarb is delicious, but don't eat the leaves. All right. So a, a lot of fresh, dry, hopped beers. I mean, sure. <coughs> We have a vote for a salute to snails. Maybe I'll have Annette on as my guest of honor for that. I don't know. I mean, she could talk about snails for hours. You would have to really be signing yourself up for something. like Because you know how excited she gets about snails. Corework says, I want to learn to breed rabbit snails. I've never had a rabbit snail. I don't breed anything intentionally. I'm not really a breeder of anything. There are better streams for you than this. I don't breed children. I don't breed fish. I guess I have bred snails, but not intentionally. Hops are a cool looking plant. Yes, they are related to marijuana, actually. It depends on how you parse the families or the, the species or yeah, the genus. Some people put them in the same family, marijuana and hops. Some people put them in two different families, Depend, just depends on who's doing the taxonomy, but they are closely related and they both look really cool. They get really tall. Thanks for dropping this a fish cord link, Zenger. We have lots of people on fish cord. Love to have you on it. <coughs> Jeremy says Coors Banquet was the only beer I ever liked. Well, there you go. My dad likes to drink Old Milwaukee. Now there's a fancy beer. Jenna says, that's a lot of pressure, Kelly. You're up to the task. We're, we're easy to please. I told Jake about the king cake last night. He's so excited. I mean, there is nothing he loves more than a commercially paired, prepared slightly stale pastry. I mean, he's on board. So you've already made him happy. <coughs> Oh, gosh. All right. Sending me some stream ideas. That's cool. How far behind are we? Good Lord. We're, I'm like over a Rico behind. I can never live up to the standards demanded by an expensive. <laughs> I mean. Well, we weren't going to drive. I mean, because we're only going to be there three days. So we were not going to drive. That was not going to happen. All right. Jenny says, exactly. I'm going to go out by saying, look at that big kitty over there. Then it will let me pet it. Not because I ate a friggin' salad. <laughs> That's right. That is what's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm going to get some cat disease. There are so many cats outside my house and they just live on my porch now and they meow at me and demand I pet them and demand I feed them. I'm just, I'm very oppressed by pets. There's so many of them. <sighs> Scuba Steve says, how do you lose IQ points and still smarter than me? Well, um, so when you run electrophoresis gels of RNA, so if you're analyzing RNA in the lab, you need to have a reducing environment for them and use formaldehyde. And these gels, I would use 3% formaldehyde buffer in them, and I would use liters and liters of it. And I would run them in the fume hood, right? Because like, I don't want that exhaust in the lab like I'm polite like that but to load the gel I had to like stick my face right over it for like 30 minutes and huff all of that formaldehyde fumes and I'm sure that made me dumber I mean the things I used to do in the lab I once ate a sandwich in the radioactive lab I mean that's a terrible idea <coughs> 
But Coral Works is getting dumber due to an IPA. So there you go. <coughs> Many honeys are fraudulent, not even honey, let alone what variety it is. It's true. I mean, a lot of them are adulterated with corn syrup. I don't know if there's any good regulatory body for that. I guess it's best to buy your honey from a farmer, from a beekeeper that you know, if you can do that. But it won't be Manuka honey unless you live in, what is it, New Zealand or Australia? Crypt Keeper sees coral. I only buy honey from local bee farmers. There you go. But Mark says, yes, Manuka is a variety of New Zealand tea tree. Yes, it's very trendy. I'm scrolling, scrolling, hoping to catch up. Sounds like I'm talking into a fan. I mean, maybe I am. I don't know. <sighs> All right. Alex says, jaundice view of medical papers after a FOB Nigerian NP showed me these studies that purported to show NSAIDs and acetaminophen were better than opioids as analgesics. Lies, damn lies, statistics. Well, that's harsh words, but you know, all I have to say is there are a lot of poor quality papers out there. There are a lot of shitty journals. I mean, like, you know, and you, you, that's why things like looking up journal impact factor can really help you. I mean, I have found articles before in like the Iranian Journal of Podiatry. I mean, no offense, Iranian podiatrists, but it's not a high quality journal. The studies in it are not very good. Um, nobody cites anything from the Iranian Journal of Podiatry ever. So, you know, that's why it's good to be able to evaluate these. Look for meta-analyses, look for systematic reviews. What'd you fix for me? All the audio. I don't know. I can't hear my own audio. Thanks for fixing it. I don't know what I'd do without you. <sighs> Kelly starts singing, buy it, use it, fix it, break it, trash it, mail it, upgrade it. I don't know this song. Is it a commercial? I have no idea. Johnny says that Gloroannas are my dream fish. I'll be the first in Petco to get one. So I guess that would be a glowing arowana. I mean, that would be really cool. I wonder if they'll make that. I mean, arowanas are kind of expensive as is. I don't know. Stephen, always plugging things into different holes. I didn't even know, notice you come on and fix it. Let's get Kelly a CRISPR kit so she can make glow Oscars for June. I mean, I would do it for June. I mean, whatever. If she wants it, I'll do it. If she wants a glow cat, I'll make her a glow cat. I mean, whatever. <sighs> Steven says, it's a weird bug, but literally just toggling echo cancellation off and on will fix it. Where is that? Oh, you'll have to tell me later. I have no idea. Technology, not so good with it. Coral Works says, I was going to do a refugium in my sump, but it's full of sponge and K1 and Metalla and pump. I need a bigger sump. Yes, you do. You need a bigger sump. You need a bigger tank. I'm always going to encourage you to get a bigger tank because therein lies happiness. Johnny says, I had a canister filter and it was full of scuds during water changes. When I turned it off, they'd all migrate up in the spray bar. When I turned it back on, scuds would shoot out. How cool is that? I would love to have my canister be full of scuds. That would be great. I mean, the rainbows would love it. Plus, I just like the idea of live food with no work because I am too lazy to culture baby brine shrimp. It's not going to happen. Oh, but Scuba Stevo says, fuck scuds. But Geek Boy loves them. Make up your mind, chat. What's your opinion on scuds? Fuck Kale. I still agree with you. We have Ian just came in, but I'm behind. So I have no clue when you came in. I really don't know. I also don't know how many people are here. I don't know how to say hi to all of you. I don't know how any of this works. Steven has to fix all of it for me. I just don't know. All right. See, <coughs> a lot of people love scuds. I want to know why Scuba Sivo hates scuds. I mean, 
I really want to know. Whoa, he's passionate about hating the Scuds. Wow. Oh, gosh. Could have grown my channel by doing that. I know. See how far behind I am? I'm way far behind in chat. Yeah, I mean, people will subscribe. If you, if you eat those nasty canned blood worms, somebody will subscribe to you. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, you know, I have a niche channel. I mean, I would have more people if I made videos, but uh, it's just, nah. I mean, if other people make me videos, I will put them on. Like Annette has made me videos and I post all of them. I will post anything Annette makes for me. Did you hear that, Annette? I will post anything you make, anything. And for those of you who know her taste in TikToks, that's frightening. But I will post anything she makes. <coughs> I put fish tanks over my parsley and chives and have uh, and have them all but six weeks a year. That is so cool. So I am actually getting a hydroponic wall for this tank behind me. I've thought about growing vegetables in it, but I'll probably just grow more houseplants. <sighs> All right. <coughs> oh, God, Zenny, I'm wrong. Per Google, per Google. Like other leafy greens, green vegetables, arugula is part of the Brassicaceae family. I'm wrong. It's a Brassica. Well, there you heard it first. Zenny, I was wrong. Lettuces are part of the Asteraceae family, but arugula is a Brassica. I was wrong. I was wrong. You heard it here first. I'm frequently wrong. I'm okay with that. All right. Let me rephrase. I'll eat an active cichlid fry to get me in one case. Steve-O, don't do that. You're, you're better than that. You're better than that. You're not going to eat a cichlid fry. You're not going to do that. Eating a yucky food is one thing, but you're not going to eat a cichlid fry. Don't do it. <laughs> Someone get the soap. I heard that. Speaking of soap, one of these weeks we're gonna do the chemistry of soap as a as a topic on uh, on this year's stream. Cause I used to make soap. Fun fact about me: it was a hobby that was a terrible business that I did not make any money at. I am terrible at business, except for medical writing. But uh, yeah. Matt, if the soap doesn't work, I have some Carolina Reapers in the fridge. No, no, I can't handle any, no, no chili, none at all. I have a delicate constitution. So I went to this restaurant called Mercado in Fort Wayne, and the food there was so spicy. And I even told them, like, is, I asked them, like, is this spicy? Like, no, no, no. And I ordered this, like, tuna with... It was like a fusion cuisine. It was like Japanese, Mexican, stupid, trendy food. Anyways, my throat started closing off. It was so hot. Like, I, I have like a little bit of PTSD about that restaurant. I feel, yeah, I can't go back there. So anyways, no, I won't eat it. <coughs> Rico says, I tried yoga today, Kelly. I only managed two poses. Catching the big toe and bitch news crush. <laughs> I think I have a bad guru. So, Rico, there is a pose that I want you to do, and it's one you're going to like. It's called Savasana. S-A-V-A-S-A-N-A. -A -A. You'll like it. Look it up. It'll be your favorite pose, I guarantee you. But bitch news crotch, well, there you go. All right, Brian wants to know if those Aves Creek behind you, for sure, the, them's my Aves Creeks. I've had those for two and a half years now. They are Bozmani, Melanitania Bozmani catch location. They're awesome. I got them from Dan's Fish. Great looking fish. I really like mine. <laughs> Scotty says, or Scotty Aquati, there's many Scotties. They're all here. Says Annette needs to live stream. I mean, she has a lot of children and they're very young. And, you know, she just doesn't have the time that I have. So we have to treasure our moments with Annette 
while we have them because her children need her, whether she likes it or not. So Stephen says, I think they are Itinjo, but my memory is bad. Nope, I have Aves Creek. I have Aves Creek, not Itinjo. Though those are cool too. That's another choice. Seems like it would be illegal to breed children. I mean, it should be. I don't have any. Steve says, I used to grow hops on pot farm on Facebook to protect my pot from the sheriff. But yet you're just saying it on a public forum right here, Steve. Come on. Use better judgment. All right. Well, we're running to the end. Oh, gosh. We're done, folks. I'm behind in chat, but that's just that. Everyone, go to Chattanooga Ed stream right now, mods. Please drop, drop the link. The hashtag is Fat Kitty. Fat Kitty. Please drop the link. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, mods. Thank you, Steven. Can't do this without you fixing everything. Um, I appreciate every every single one of you. And um, have a good night. I'll see you in a week. Bye.